Welcome, everyone. It's uh, my great privilege to join with you together as we discuss the power of community, how we can think about building inclusive networks of research and support. Um, this is the third year in our PSI supported merit sponsored networking um, presentation and conference. Uh, we continue to meet um, in virtual, although we do have an opportunity to meet in person at the conclusion of today, uh, an opportunity to connect with uh, friends and colleagues and start that transition back where we are able to, to network again um, with friends um, around these themes. Before we begin, I think it's important, particularly if we're going to have a conversation about building inclusive networks and supporting one another, that we acknowledge who is a part of our communities and who is a part of our networks. And we can't begin that conversation until we understand um, where we are positioned and where we are. And so for me here on the McMaster campus, um, I, it's essential that we acknowledge this idea that the land that we gather on is the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee. It's protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And so understanding that connection about who is in our networks, I think it's appropriate we just pause and reflect and, and think about what's our connection with uh, the First Nations that were here, that continue to be here, and how we integrate and communicate and can include them in our conversations, in our research, and in our networks. In addition to the, the staff and the many members of the Merit community that we're gonna acknowledge later in the day, I think it's important that we acknowledge the work of the Physician Services Incorporated PSI Foundation that has provided on a restricted educational grant for us to run this visiting scholars program. At the concluding session, we will have an opportunity to hear more specifically about the work of PSI and how it supports academia and research within the province. But let's begin with our opening plenary and before our guest speaker is introduced, I want to introduce our facilitator, um, an individual that's had considerable influence here in the McMaster community, and that will be known to many of you, uh, Dr. Susan Reed. Dr. Reed is a professor and past chair of the Department of Surgery here at McMaster, and was in fact the first female surgeon in Canada to become a department chair in an academic department. She has held a number of senior leadership and academic roles, including program director for the general surgery training program here at McMaster, chair of the postgraduate training program directors for the Canadian Association of General Surgeons, and then has been the past president of the Canadian Association of General Surgeons. It is my delight to welcome her to help facilitate our conversation this morning, and uh, Dr. Reed will introduce Dr. Philpott. Thanks very much, Jonathan, for those kind words. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jane Philpott. I'm very excited to, uh, to hear her plenary session this morning. So Dr. Uh, Jane Philpott is the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences and Director of the School of Medicine at Queen's University and CEO of the Southeastern Ontario Academic Medical Organization. She is a medical doctor, a professor of family medicine and former member of parliament. Prior to politics, Jane spent the first decade of her medical career in Niger, West Africa. She's a family doctor in Markham Stouffville for 17 years and became the chief of family medicine at the Markham Stouffville Hospital in 2008. From 2015 to 2019, she served as the Federal Minister of Health, the Minister of Indigenous Services, President of the Treasury Board, and Minister of Digital Government. She currently serves as, as the Minister's Special Advisor for Ontario Health Data Platform and was recently elected to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Congratulations on that. Today, uh, we're going to uh, listen to Dr. Philpott discuss her uh, plenary session, An Accidental Ally, uh, where she'll discuss her own personal experiences, stories, and examples of how allyship and advocacy can work why they matter, and how healthcare professionals can help develop these competencies to influence change. So um, just, and then a, just a couple of housekeeping things, just that um, the, at the conclusion, we will take some questions to the audience after uh, I have some questions for Dr. Philpott. So if you wanna just put your questions into the chat 
then I will be able to scroll through those and call on you to ask your question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Philpott. Thanks very much. Well, good morning, everyone. And I'm very grateful for the invitation. Thank you, Susan, for the kind introduction and uh, also to Jonathan for hosting this event. Uh, I'm very happy to be joining you virtually from Kingston, Ontario. Interestingly, as uh, Jonathan was acknowledging the territory uh, on which many of you are located right now, uh, you'll uh, find it interesting to to know that uh, the lands around Kingston also are the traditional territory of both Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg peoples, uh, and also covered by the uh, uh, Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant. So uh, we, we share that, uh, that uh, history of the lands uh, around the Kingston area, and it's a pleasure to, to be joining you from uh, that, this territory today. Um, so I'm looking forward to our conversation. I've taken a little bit of liberty with the topic. I'm going to try to be uh, relatively personal and uh, somewhat informal in my remarks today. Your, your theme is a really interesting one about the power of community and really looking forward to a conversation with you who are, I think, in many ways, uh, real um, colleagues with us here at Queen's where we also have a faculty of health sciences that includes medicine and nursing and rehabilitation therapy and I'm glad to see that your conference is inclusive of, of uh, multiple professions and uh, you talked a little bit about the idea for my talk about um, about sponsorship uh, in terms of of uh, supporting and being inclusive. And so I've uh, taken the liberty of, of framing it around the concept of being an ally. And I'm going to just pause for one second here while I attempt to share my screen. Um, I talked a little bit about the links between allyship, advocacy, and activism. And if you can go on to the next slide. Um, I think of, of all of these concepts, the one that we talk about the most in, in health sciences uh, is the concept and specifically we uh, we consider be what it is to be a health advocate and I share there for uh, your consideration some of the definitions of an advocate writ large. Um, I think I'll just move things along here so we can catch up a little bit of time. Uh, but what is it to be an ally? And you'll, you'll hear lots of conversation around allyship, I think, increasingly as we learn more about what it means to be an inclusive community. And uh, many of us are called to be allies. And uh, this was not a term that uh, was part of our vocabulary, I would say, until fairly recently. Uh, but some uh, in intelligent Canadians have been writing about allyship for some time. And one of them that I wanted to draw your attention to is Anne Bishop, who's actually written a book about allyship, which I think is, is uh, one of the, the best resources that I have uh, come across in terms of what it means to be an ally have framed my talk about being an accidental ally because uh, it seems as I uh, read some of Anne's work uh, that I realized that without understanding the concept um, had happened to become an ally over the years of my career. And she says that an ally is someone who recognizes the unearned privilege they receive from society's patterns of injustice, but takes responsibility for changing these patterns. And so I want to reflect on Anne's definition and uh, tell you a little bit about my personal journey into allyship, stumbling my way into allyship, as it were, uh, and how I have uh, made some attempts to take responsibility for changing society's patterns of injustice and my further reflections on what we as faculties of health sciences can do in that regard. So let's go on to the next slide and just give you one more um, definition or, re or reason resource uh, for your consideration. And I suspect that some of you in the audience are familiar with the, the work and the writing of Dr. Stephanie Nixon, who is currently at the University of Toronto, but I'm very excited to say is coming to join us very soon here in Kingston. She is our incoming uh, Vice Dean and Director of the School of Rehabilitation Therapy. Stephanie has written one of the most widely cited international uh, um, articles about allyship, uh, which is called the Coin 
growing model of privilege and critical allyship. And uh, if you haven't already uh, come across that article, I strongly recommend you have a look at it. And she talks again in a similar way to what Anne Bishop talks about in terms of, of uh, the essential uh, requirement to be aware about our positions of privilege and that the obliviousness of people about those positions of privilege is actually a strategy uh, that uh, sustains the hegemony of the systems of inequality that exist within health systems. So uh, we'll come back to that definition a little later along the way and we'll move to the next slide. So I said earlier that I described myself as an accidental ally because way back in the 1980s, almost 40 years ago now, when I was a medical student, um, partly through the uh, influence of peers in my medical school class, um, I began to start to understand a little bit about the positions of privilege that I had in my life, uh, not having grown up uh, necessarily in any uh, affluent circumstances, but having grown up uh, in a place where I didn't understand uh, the global uh, economic and political powers that had allowed me to be born into a place uh, where I had uh, safety and uh, relative affluence and uh, security in my home. Um, so back in the day uh, of, of uh, the early 1980s, I uh, had my first opportunity to travel outside of the country and spent about four months in Western Kenya, that's the photo on the left where this, this young and relatively naive medical student st first started to understand that not everybody enjoys the same kinds of uh, uh, health outcomes and health care opportunities that we have in Canada. And uh, in part because of that, ended up deciding to spend the first decade of my career, as uh, Susan said, uh, living and working in Sub-Saharan Africa. We uh, lived in the country of Niger in West Africa, and that's the photo on the right side where I worked both as a, as a general practitioner, but also as a community health uh, trainer uh, in villages in um, in rural Niger. Next slide. And so uh, uh, this, uh, I, I wanted to also share that this was uh, probably the most dramatic but most important uh, experience of allyship that I had in my life and career. And that was when I, my personal pain uh, intersected with my understanding of what it meant to live in another culture and to uh, experience what other peoples uh, that are different from me um, uh, socially and ethnically uh, experience. And that was that while we were living in Niger um, in, uh, in 1991, very suddenly, um, our two daughters on the same day developed uh, meningococcemia. Um, and our daughter, Emily, who is on the left in the first photo, uh, was the last photo that was ever taken of her. Um, our daughter, Emily, woke up one Monday morning with fever and vomiting and uh, by mid-afternoon had died of meningococcemia. Um, our daughter, Bethany, who is the baby in the photo uh, on the left, um, also developed meningococcemia, but um, through uh, a number of uh, miraculous uh, circumstances, survived and is now a family doctor uh, in Belleville, not very far from us. I share that with you um, in a kind of a, 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 a non-emotional way, but to share with you that what that experience did uh, for me and how it influenced me in my career was, and how we survived emotionally from that experience was a recognition that despite being the worst uh, thing that ever happened in our lives, um, that we were not actually different. We were not special. In fact, we had experienced so much less trauma uh, and so much less grief and loss than the people around us. At that time in the country of Niger, 27% of children didn't live to see their fifth birthday. And so I came to understand in a very acute and painful way um, uh, our own position of privilege uh, that one of our daughters did have the opportunity to be evacuated from the country and to survive, um, but came to understand a little bit about the, what it was like to be a woman living in rural Niger and losing our children from preventable and treatable infectious diseases. Next slide. Um, and so just to uh, 
reiterate that the lesson in that in part is um, to realize that uh, society has, uh, has in, uh, entrenched patterns of injustice and that our response to those, the recognition of our, of our privilege and the recognition of our position um, is to take some responsibility to learn from, uh, from what we begin, begin to understand and to try to do what we can uh, to change the patterns of injustice. Next slide. And so we eventually returned from Niger, um, eventually had three more children uh, and settled into a practice in the Markham Stouffville area, uh, but could never ever get out of my mind um, what I had learned from living in Niger. Uh, could never get out of my mind the fact that um, friends and colleagues, for example, were dying of HIV, um, which at, by that time in Canada had become a uh, a relatively treatable infectious disease, uh, but my friends in Niger didn't have access to the same kinds of treatment. And so my journey into allyship began a little bit more around activism and uh, launching a, a campaign called Give a Day to World AIDS, which has since been adapted uh, by the Stephen Lewis Foundation, who were the, uh, uh, one of the recipients of the work that we had done um, as an attempt to say, uh, we need to do even small things uh, to, to change patterns of injustice and the Give a Day campaign uh, was a, a request of my colleagues at Markham Civil Hospital and eventually beyond uh, to recognize World AIDS Day each year by giving one day's pay to an organization that would, would use the money well in the fight against HIV. Uh, next slide. Um, but then uh, eventually had the opportunity, and here's where we start to get into uh, what health sciences and academic medicine can do uh, to realize that I could do much more and that I could actually use the tools that I had acquired through uh, becoming a medical educator and learning about uh, building programs in family medicine uh, and had the opportunity to work with colleagues in the Toronto Addis Ababa academic collaboration to, uh, to assist in the launching of uh, family medicine training in uh, Ethiopia, the first program of its kind that eventually launched in 2013 after about five years of, of work in partnership. Uh, and so again, this was an opportunity to recognize that the kinds of not only health care and health systems, but health sciences education uh, that we experience in Canada it was not uh, widely available and that in fact uh, only half of the medical schools in the world had a, uh, had uh, training programs in family medicine uh, and that we could use um, our own positions of privilege to be able to uh, to uh, move towards equity. Uh, next slide. Um, it's funny as you uh, journey in life and become an ally and become aware of uh, different kinds of uh, inequities that exist, you find yourself uh, sometimes being an ally uh, for groups of people that uh, you don't uh, would, would not necessarily have predicted. And so one of the area, other areas of allyship that my patients led me into um, was the uh, uh, privilege of being an ally around um, uh, people who use drugs and um, had the opportunity to and have continued to advocate for uh, fair and just drug policy. This was a, a, a talk that I gave when I was Minister of Health and had the privilege of changing some of the legislation around um, access to supervised consumption sites, access to prescription heroin um, for the purpose of uh, bringing uh, um, access to healthcare for, for, uh, for people with problematic substance use. And then the final personal example that I want to share is on the next slide. And that was uh, my experiences when I was Minister of Indigenous Services as well as Minister of Health um, and beginning to understand in a way that I never had before uh, the uh, realities of health outcome gaps that exist between uh, uh, Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous Canadians. Uh, and that it took an incredibly long time for me to understand all of the roots uh, associated with uh, the, uh, those, the causes of those health outcome gaps, which uh, in essence are related to the denial of the rights of Indigenous peoples. Um, but that again, by having had the opportunity to travel across the country, uh, sit with people, uh, including chiefs like these chiefs in Masquachis, uh, in Alberta, 
um, and to learn about the history and the experiences uh, of Indigenous peoples gave me the uh, great privilege of, of uh, uh, becoming an ally uh, for friends and colleagues across the country. Next slide. So what I wanted to do was just to share with you sort of a, a bit of a synopsis of the lessons that that, that allyship has um, that I have learned um, uh, over the years. And then I will, in my last uh, few moments before we open for questions, talk a little bit about the implications for faculties of health sciences. So uh, 10 quick lessons. Um, one comes again from Stephanie's paper about the fact that, um, in fact, we shouldn't frame allyship as an identity, although perhaps I've done so in some of my commentary, but in fact, it's an ongoing practice that requires us uh, to uh, continuously improve our allyship and uh, continuously reflect on it. Uh, but over the years, I think the thing that has made the biggest difference for me is spending time with people, uh, people who are different from me, people who have not had the same kind of unearned uh, privilege that I have had, um, but have taught me patiently um, uh, and sometimes painfully about, um, about the entrenched patterns of injustice that exist in society. Um, and I do think that to the extent that you can do so authentically, um, sharing those experiences with people uh, is incredibly valuable. And that's why I found in particular that the years that our family spent living in Niger um, really were probably the most influential in shaping my own understanding of, of uh, global uh, socio-political inequities. Um, finally, or sorry, next, I would just argue, and this is probably an obvious one, is the importance of, of studying and re reading and learning history, um, but also listening well, and that, um, that listening uh, is absolutely essential to allyship. And then we can go on to the next slide. Um, which talks about the fact that uh, allyship requires listening to a lot of anger, listening to hurt and pain, um, and uh, doing so uh, as, as undefensively as possible, uh, and taking on uh, some responsibility around the anger uh, that, that we hear from others. Um, making sure in those circumstances as much as possible that uh, uh, mental uh, health supports are, are available for those conversations, depending on the context. Um, and finally, just thinking about how we need to act upon the things that we learn, um, recognizing that as we do so, that we will make mistakes, that we will have to be prepared for uh, continuously doing better. Uh, and finally, the greatest joy of allyship for me has been the friends that I have met in my journeys through life and how those friends have shaped me and helped me to be a better ally. So what does it mean for people in faculties of health sciences? Um, oh, sorry, I forgot about these next batch of slides. Please, you can, we'll go th very quickly through these. I recommend a book, which um, again was written long, long, long before uh, people talked about allyship. But in fact, uh, it's a fabulous one uh, called Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Patton. And there's a, in many ways, a beautiful description of his experiences growing up uh, in South Africa um, and uh, being surrounded by uh, all sorts of what his family perceived to be goodness, but in fact, having learned nothing at all about the place that he lived in. Next slide. Uh, and I'll just go through these quickly, but i um, happy to, to, for you to share the slides and, and, uh, and think about it. So uh, Patton's uh, reflections in the book talk about the fact that uh, having understood and reflected upon those patterns of his injustice, um, that his devotion should be actually to the service of South Africa. And on the next slide, um, talking about um, doing this um, because uh, balancing all of the other possibilities of how he should spend his time. Uh, it was the only thing that was a possible way to go forward was to what was right and to speak what was true. And so the next slide does start to talk about some of the things that um, I have found now that I have the incredible privilege of being the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences here at Queens, uh, that I can use this um, um, opportunity as a tool for uh, a 
addressing those patterns of injustice and that we as, as uh, academics have an enormous access to tools. And so like you at McMaster, we've been doing a lot of work on issues like equity, diversity, inclusion, indigeneity and accessibility. Um, we launched a table, one of the, the first things I did as Dean in my first two weeks here was to launch an action table on EDI uh, where we have for the last two years had 160 active volunteers across all three schools, including faculty, staff, and students uh, who are working on seven, seven different initiatives. Um, we opened an office for equity and have a, a new associate dean for equity and social accountability and are uh, currently on a search for a, an associate dean in Indigenous health. Um, we've opened up opportunities for uh, donors and philanthropists to be able to contribute to a fund that allows uh, student projects and a number of other initiatives uh, related to equity. The next slide uh, talks about um, the uh, student initiatives that we have been able to support. And also um, I will just share with you because I do think one of our things that we can do together is uh, share the kinds of resources that we're all working on together. And I'll just put in the chat that link if you wanna have a look at it because, um, and of course, we're always happy to share ideas um, and the uh, EDI page on our website will give you just an, a really great overview of the amazing things that our students are doing um, and just encourage you on that website to scroll down uh, and load more stories about the kinds of things that are happening. And, and if any of them are useful to the work that you're doing at, at McMaster, we would be uh, delighted to, for you to, to adapt those to your own context. And I wanted to point out on the next slide specifically one of the resources that we're really proud of and happy to share on that page is a toolkit uh, for language uh, um, and the, the styles that we use, the words that we use. We consider this to be an evergreen document because we do know that we make mistakes and that we are continuously need to learn. Uh, but our EDI style guide um, has is probably the most uh, popular part of our EDI web page overall. Um, and uh, again, we're happy to hear from your feedback on that style guide and hope that you will find it useful. Um, we had found that there was nothing else out there available to us for being able to educate ourselves about the terminologies that we used. Um, and uh, again, we would love to have your feedback anytime. On the next slide, um, I'll just point out the fact that probably like you, um, that we have really made sure that the principles of, ec of uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, indigeneity, and accessibility have found their way into our strategic planning here in the Faculty of Health Sciences um, with a number of outcomes um, uh, that we've made a commitment to, to make our uh, academic uh, home a more fair and inclusive place. So happy to answer any questions or comments on that. And we'll just close by wrapping up with back to the slides that we talked about before. Um, and that's that we cannot um, be oblivious uh, to our positions of privilege. Uh, that if we do so, that that is actually part of the sustenance of the systems of inequality that exist. And on the very last slide, which is the next one, I just wanted to remind us all um, that as we do self-reflect, which is essential in allyship, um, that our uh, response as we recognize that privilege is not to deny it, uh, not to feel guilty about it, but to continue in self-reflection, um, but most of all to uh, go forward with informed action, as I know that you are all doing in the work that you do each day uh, to recognize, to reflect, uh, and to act on the basis of what we learn. So I will stop there and look forward to any feedback, comments or questions uh, or sharing what you're working on in, uh, in making McMaster Health Sciences uh, a, a great place. Well, Jane, thank you so much for that incredibly inspiring talk. And I will say thank you also for sharing your personal painful experience with um, your daughter, Emily. And what's truly inspiring is your ability to reflect upon that in the context of that local experience. And um, I personally find that um, incredible and also very inspiring as I'm sure other people do. So um, thank you very much for sharing that. I'm sure that even after this time that has passed, it's still very painful and not easy to do. So we feel very, very privileged that you were able to, to bring that forward to us because it's very impactful. Um, so thank you for that. 
Um, and just a reminder, if people do have questions, that just go ahead and put them in the chat box, and then I can uh, try and track those. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, bring you back to was the concept of the coin model um, by Stephanie Nixon. And uh, one of the things I found interesting about that model is the fact that um, you can find yourself on the top of one coin and on the bottom of another coin. And I thought that maybe you were someone who might have had experience in that uh, regard. And I wondered if you had any reflection on that idea of being on the top of one coin, but the bottom of another and how that can help inform us as, as we go forward and as we reflect. Thanks, Susan. That's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I won't do uh, Stephanie's paper justice by sort of describing that. So I will encourage your those who haven't aren't familiar with your paper to uh, definitely have a look at, at that, um, because it really is an interesting uh, look at intersectionality, which is, I, I think, what you're really describing there. Um, and I, for me, I think the most important thing has been to think about um, uh, who, you know, those of us who are women in medicine, uh, for example, um, are often sort of put forward as examples of someone who, you know, breaks barriers or uh, perseveres in spite of, of uh, gender, uh, dis gender based discrimination. Um, for me, I have tended to try to focus not so much on the fact that, you know, that could have been a perceived barrier to being able to uh, get things done, um, but to, to reflect on um, the fact that, uh, yes, gender could have been a barrier, but in fact, there are much more profound barriers in my experience in terms of the, the places where I seek to have, have sought to, to have influence. Um, and that uh, the discrimination that's race-based or um, uh, based on people's uh, sexual orientation or gender identity are in fact often far, far more profound uh, than gender-based discrimination. Um, and that the things that I could change were, um, uh, were recognizing that, um, that there are many people who had faced much greater discrimination than I ever had on the basis of being a woman. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's necessarily, I've described how I've helped in that regard, but um, I have uh, tried to, to not focus as much on, on what has held me back or could have held me back, uh, even though I've got lots of examples in my life of where I feel like I've been treated less fairly because of my gender, uh, but that in fact, because I've had white skin um, and because I've been born into, um, into a, a place where I had access to public education and all kinds of other benefits in my life that were unearned, um, that I should uh, focus instead on trying to, to uh, tip the scales for those who didn't have the um, opportunities that I had had. That's, that's such an um, insightful answer because I think, you know, with that model that there's these, you know, systems of social injustices um, I, what I hear is that, you know, not all, for each individual, um, those different um, potential social injustices have different um, levels for each individual. And so, although you still experience them on uh, the different, you know, or the different facets, um, it's, it's really as a, your own experience of which you're going to focus on and uh, how you um, prioritize those different um, social injustices and where you focus your actions. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, so when you were, um, you know, starting out as the, the young medical student, um, I, I'm sure now you must reflect upon those days and, you know, what, what is it that you would have wished that you had known then? Um, or what you could tell yourself now as the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, uh, what would you tell a young medical student who was embarking upon the same type of experience that you underwent? 
That's a great question. And, um, you know, a lot has changed since the 1980s. I'm not sure if there's anybody else on the, uh, on the call who uh, went through their training back then. Um, and uh, as I say, in many ways, there was naivete. In many ways, also, there was incredible opportunity. Um, and uh, I often joke, I don't know whether there are any other Western grads around, um, but I often joke about the fact that I'm not even sure that I had any learning objectives when I when when Western let me head <laughs> off to Western Kenya um, for my for my uh, elective. But things that changed my life in a positive way because of what I learned about um, things like social determinants of health, which we, as far as I can recall, didn't talk about at all in the 1980s. Um, but I learned firsthand um, that people are sick or people are well because of socioeconomic factors uh, as much as biomedical factors. Um, you know, I think um, what I didn't know enough about at that time was the potential risks uh, associated with my um, interactions and the potential harms, uh, not risks to myself, but risks of harming others through my work. Um, and, you know, I think we do a lot better job of that now um, because we help people to realize that as we um, as we interact uh, in without adequate understanding of the of the historic factors that and and, and uh, socio political factors uh, that cause inequities, that you can actually sometimes do more harm than good. Um, and so I think you know, thankfully now uh, when we do have uh, um, opportunities like international travel um, and when we are working. Um, with populations uh, for whom we don't understand their history. Uh, we, I think, do a lot better job at making sure that our learners and our faculty um, are, uh, are, have educated themselves better in advance. So um, I learned on the, on the, uh, on the uh, job, I guess, uh, as it were, on the fly, uh, why things were the way that they were, but had not reflected enough in advance. So I think the biggest lesson is just um, know what you're doing. Don't be, you know, afraid necessarily to, uh, you know, to to go and 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 as I said, if if in an authentic, fair, and safe uh, way, you can interact with uh, a population from your own. Then, and I say safe, not not out of concern for your personal safety, but to safe from the point of view that you will um, recognize the potential harm that you can cause, um, then I think that that's a, a fabulous way to be able to uh, understand how you then can take the unearned privilege you have to be able to, um, to influence those patterns of injustice. Well, great, great advice for, for potential um first forays into, into uh, international health. And thankfully, many universities now do have programs uh, for any students, residents who are planning uh, any type of uh, advocacy trips or, or work. So thank you. I'm just conscious of the time a little bit. Um, so I'm going to jump into the, the questions that are in the chat. And um, so Renat uh, has a question um, ab about um, uh, research. Um, Renat, did, did, would you like to pose your question yourself if you want to come on? Sure. Um, so I'm a white settler researcher doing some research in the EDI space. Uh, and I think what I struggle with is trying to um, figure out how to represent and recruit and raise the voices of BIPOC people without being like one of many, many EDI projects led by white people who that, that then draining resources without giving enough back. So I think it's partly trying to recruit people who are not already drained and like give them benefits from being associated with the project and partly just making sure I'm being careful when I try to take people's time. And I'm wondering if you have any insight into that, given that you're involved in so many kind of large committees that have a lot of, I imagine, BIPOC representation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, is it, is it, how do you say your first name? Uh, it's Renata. 
Okay. Thanks, Ron. I Ronna. go on that way a lot, so <laughs> it's totally okay. fine. Uh, thank you very much for your your question, and you really hit upon one of the challenges that I think uh, is is. Uh, fairly ubiquitous, and I'm not sure that there's necessarily an easy solution. Um, because the health sciences have not been a, an, in, uh, an inclusive and representative space uh, to the extent that we should have been over a very long time, um, there, there is a, a, a real challenge in, around the burden uh, of the work that needs to be done to achieve uh, equity. Uh, so, you know, some of the things that we've tried to do that one of the reasons that I established the EDI fund um, at, in our faculty was so that we could support students in particular who felt that they were uh, wanted to be able to do work in this space. Um, and these are BIPOC students uh, in particular, um, but felt that everything that they were being asked to do was as a volunteer. Uh, and so we've tried to create more funding resources. Um, I think we still have a long way to go. Our, our BIPOC faculty in particular are, um, face an um, enormous amount of, of work, but um, have also found a way to, to really um, um, use allies. And I think it's, I mean, you, it, your work as an ally is incredibly important. And I think as long as we are always acknowledging our need to be learning um, that uh, uh, most, most uh, um, BIPOC faculty, as, a, as an example, will realize that they can't do all of the work uh, and don't want to do all of the work and shouldn't have to, uh, but as long as they can count on people who will be um, undefensive in being uh, open to getting feedback for whether the, for the times that we do make mistakes in the work that we're doing, um, that that's how we're going to be able to go forward. So I, uh, it sounds to me like that's exactly what you're trying to do. And I really encourage you uh, to continue to do that. But that I think really speaks to the urgency that we all need to have in our work around um, making our communities uh, more representative of who Canada is. Um, because that will, uh, and, and we've got a lot of work uh, and redress um, to, uh, to deal with the inequities that have existed for such a long time. Thank you. And then um, there's a post from Natasha, uh, just a, a link if anyone uh, wants to see that. It's a, a TED talk on um, uh, intersectionality. So thank you very much, uh, Natasha, for posting that. And then Mark uh, has a question about self-reflection and informed action. Uh, Mark, would you like to uh, pose your question? Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Reed, and uh, thank you for your talk, uh, Dr. Philpott. Um, yeah, I think the key takeaways you had at the end really stood out to me, and, and I was thinking kind of at a curriculum level how, how to kind of bring these things to light. You know, um, I know in the medical education context, we talk a lot about advocacy, but I often find them as, you know, these one-off workshops, or, you know, even though we're building these toolkits now, um, they often don't tend to be spread out over time. And I'm just curious if you have any, you know, ideas or things that have worked in your context, or you think could work to really embed these skills throughout the curriculum, both for all learners, students, but also administrators and, and faculty. Wow, I, um, that's thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that great that great comment. And I I heartily agree with you that um, the kinds of of tools like self uh, self reflection and form action absolutely have to be embedded into every aspect of our of our curriculum and the work that we do. Um, sometimes when I do a talk on a theme like this, I have a a slide that has a picture of a pair of jeans with patches all over it, and then another picture by its side of a beautiful woven tapestry where where the threads are are intersecting throughout. And I've said, you know, in our curriculum, as we want to uh, bring principles of of EDI into our curriculum, do we want to be a pat, uh, a pair of patched jeans or do we want to be a a beautifully woven tapestry? Um, and you know, that's all to say that it's not about you know patching a little piece of, of, uh, of improvement um, on a 
on a curriculum that was written in a, in a colonial mindset, but it's actually about going through that curriculum with a fine tooth comb um, and uh, finding ways to make sure that principles of anti-racism and anti-oppression are woven throughout everything that we do. Um, and that the examples that I went over fairly quickly with about our students is a really great example of, of um, you know, who would think that a, you know, a dermatology just kind of add on to it. Well, of course, we need to, you know, think about think about people uh, from different ethnic backgrounds. But what our students actually did, for example, was went through our undergrad in the MD program, our undergrad curriculum um, in dermatology, and looked at every image uh, that was being used in the PowerPoint presentations and the textbooks and all of the uh, resources the students were being given, and they analyzed, you know, a thousand images and and um, then were able to do an analysis of how many of them used white skin versus um, uh, other uh, skin color types and. Uh, it ended up leading to this really great project where um, we brought in a resource called Visual DX and have been able to completely overhaul um, at least the images that were used in the in the curriculum. Um, and so that just speaks to one little example. And you could do the same thing around language, right? The words that are used and use something like the EDI style guide to actually go through the words that are, you know, in your, I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Reed in the surgery curriculum, you know, to sort of think about what would it be like to kind of go with a fine tooth comb and look with an anti-racist or anti-oppressive lens on the case studies that are being used in your um, in your curriculum. So it's it really is, as you said, Mark, it can't be tokenistic. It can't be kind of a, a slap shot here, dab of dab of equity here and a dab of diversity there. It actually re requires us um, to essentially um, comb through uh, the work that we do, um, what we teach, how we teach, and the context or culture in which we teach all are part of what uh, what is required of us as as academics, I believe. Yeah, just I you know just love that concept of the uh, the tapestry model. That's uh, that's really uh, quite an effective um, a visual. At least it is for me, and um, I I think that um, you know you know when you look at medical students coming into their medical training. Uh, they come with this, uh, with a desire to help people. We hear that. Um, I, it's, a, it's a heart of service, right? And so um, I wonder, you know, how do we, you know, mesh those together, that concept of, of continually um, supporting that heart of service, but bringing in the focus and the action that's needed as you look at racism and oppression and, um, and continually, uh, uh, you know, bringing that to the forefront, because I think sometimes that heart of service um, gets suppressed a, a bit um, as students are coping with all the other demands that are on them. And uh, it, it can sort of fall, uh, fall a little bit behind. Yeah. So um, I, um, I think we have uh, another couple of uh, questions and I'm just conscious again of the time. Uh, but we'll see that uh, what we can uh, get in. Um, so is it, uh, next is uh, Natasha Johnson has a uh, question, Natasha. Um, Hi, thanks. Natasha's also <laughs> put a link in as well. Yeah, I'm loving this conversation and dialogue. So thanks very much, Dr. Philpott, for this uh, amazing presentation, just talking about um, representation and the lack of it in, in all spheres, including sort of whose images are, are, are shared in our medical textbooks. And I wanted to amplify um, the work of a young uh, Nigerian medical student. So that's the link that I put there. But I, I, what I wanted to know if you could comment on, because I always find this fascinating is, um, I, I find that the academy has a difficult time seeing how the uh, social determinants of health impact us in the academy today, like in our everyday work. Somehow it seems a little easier to think of it in the community or in other countries. But, you know, when I reflect on in pediatrics, I'm a pediatrician, um, the, the word racism was not in our um, objectives of training, even the most recent 
milestone document that was uh, published last year, I believe it was. And so I, I'm always struck by, um, I, I find the, the, the Academy's uh, difficulty sometimes in reflecting on its own sort of everyday experience with uh, injustices within itself. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. Thanks uh, very much, Natasha, for a great question. I'm cognizant of the time and how short it is. And I, I guess I will just point you to one thought on that. Um, if you look at the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, especially number 23 and number 24, um, where uh, Justice Sinclair and, his, uh, and the other commissioners talked about the kinds of things that we need to do in health sciences education, one of the specific areas that it talks about that people don't mention very often is human rights. And for me, I think what the next level that we need to go to in the academy is to go beyond social determinants of health and realize that the underlying driver of social determinants of health is actually the, uh, uh, a, a rights-based perspective on health. Um, and so whether it's the rights of children, um, the rights of Indigenous peoples, um, fundamental human rights is actually the piece of work that we have not educated ourselves on adequately and that um, we've gone from a biomedical perspective and, and, and it's why concepts of social determinants of health are now, are now widely understood in health sciences, where I think we need to go next is really a broad understanding of human rights um, as, as the, the ultimate driver of what makes people healthy or what makes people sick. Um, and uh, that that might be a clue to, uh, to where we need to be focusing our efforts so that our curricula and everything else are reflective of justice and, uh, and equity. Well, um, thank you so much. That was just uh, really, as I said before, very inspirational and uh, just we're also very appreciative to have listened this morning and thanks to everybody for your contributions in the questions and answers and I think I'll turn it back to you, Jonathan. Um, I'll, I'll join in that. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Phil Pott, uh, for challenging us, uh, for being intimate in the narrative and the story that leads to a way for us to examine our own lives and our own position and how we kind of intersect with our communities and with our academic networks. And thank you to you, Dr. Reed, for facilitating that conversation and helping us to move from um, anger and guilt into reflection and an opportunity to understand where we can start to act. Um, in the, ch uh, the chat link, there should be an opportunity for you to provide some feedback on the session. As a community, as part of Merit, it's been very helpful to us to hear your thoughts about how we should take our, this conference forward year on year. And we have been very responsive and influenced by the, the feedback that you give to us. So please give us um, your thoughts and your comments and your reflections. Um, some, of us will, some of you will be joining us for some small group sessions where the conversation will continue in a much more um, semi-formal way where we can engage in dialogue rather than having to, to navigate uh, chat boxes. And I would encourage all of you to join us again at noon where we'll have an opportunity to hear from Dr. Karen Hauer from the University of California, San Francisco. And the respondent will be uh, Dr. Lara Varpio, an adjunct scientist here with Merit. If you haven't had a chance in the past to attend, there's also an opportunity to review our uh, previous presentations at the Merit YouTube channel from 2019 and 2021. And you can hear more about gender and academia and mentoring for inclusivity there. So with that, I'll wish you all a good morning. Um, thank you to all of you for participating and for engaging in this conversation.